Uh, welcome everyone for this uh, new chapter in Herbert's exciting course. Uh, unfortunately, I have some news to give you uh, because of, due to personal reasons, Herbert have asked me, has asked me to put the next, the following lectures on hold. Uh, so this for the time being, this will be the last lecture. Uh, and we're very sad about that, but of course, uh, Herbert, I hope that uh, we will have back you soon to finish this exciting course that you started and that many people is following. Uh, so, okay, so that's the sad announcement I, I, I have to give, but uh, without further ado, then if you please start, Herbert. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Sergio, and I'm really sorry for to everybody that we're putting this on hold, but I just don't feel very well at the moment, and I'll do the best I can today. Um, I, I, I want to talk about the fluid and elastodynamics of crack propagation, and I see I put an M here rather than N, oh, sorry about that. And this is just uh, showing you some photographs of uh, dikes or little fluid inclusions into uh, solid uh, rock. Um, whoops. So uh, he, here's a photograph of another uh, intrusion into a uh, crack. I took this on a hike. Uh, during the pandemic, and I think this is a uh, mask that I had on that I put down just to show the uh, uh, scale. So I want to talk about diking, in other words, the natural movement of fluid into rock and fracking, the human related uh, putting uh, water mainly into rocks to get out gas that's uh, stored there. And I'll talk about the elasto and fluid mechanic uh, principles, and then I'll tell you some take home messages. This is a typical dike, a uh, natural intrusion into uh, the bedding. Um, as you see, it can just go in this case uh, at right angles to uh, the bedding. And so it just goes through a whole series of different uh, uh, layers of rock. But that not need, need not be always so, uh, it could go at, uh, parallel to them, as we'll see often happens. Now, to talk about fracking, the idea of fracking is the stimulation of rock to fracture has come apart due to pressurized liquid, forcing liquid down through the rock. The liquid is generally water with sand or other propens of their coal, little pieces that help to create the uh, cracks uh, and hold them open. And the aim of these cracks, human cracks, are to release natural gas, uh, very important or oil. And then when the pressures are released, and I'll talk a little bit about this, the propens hold the fractures open for a while, the liquid flows uh, and the liquid flows back and the crack then of course closes. This was first tried in 1947 uh, to uh, get gas this way. In, in the US, it was first tried in 1949. And about 3 million frackings have occurred uh, worldwide. Um, it's an important uh, process and it gives us gas, which uh, is important to uh, heat our homes, do our cooking, do lots of important things. It's banned in a lot of places, and it's uh, not uh, the favorite of many. It's, it was banned in France uh, almost uh, uh, 10 uh, years ago. And Sarkozy said the president ban would be maintained and so proof that the shale gas exploration wouldn't harm the environment or massacre the landscape. That's what he said. It, it uh, could massacre the landscape. And it's banned in a lot of places, Bulgaria, France, Germany. There's a big uh, comment in England at the moment whether the fracking should be allowed or, or not. Many people are uh, against it. This is uh, a, uh, a picture a drawing of Sydney, Australia. You can see from the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And often say, 
when the first people who came here, did they say, gee, we're going to massacre the landscape. We're going to build houses. We're going to cut down trees. We're going to build big universities and have people talking. And hence, they should have never come to Sydney. Or was it quite reasonable that uh, Sydney should be allowed to uh, grow? Well, uh, that can be said of many uh, places. I, I don't know the best places in China to say this, but I think massacring the landscape is not what uh, development is all about. The idea here is that you put down a pipe uh, first in casing and then you turn it around into the region that uh, has the, the gas that you want to extract. How deep it has to be depends and varies from place to a place. It can be from a few hundred meters to maybe as much as a kilometer. I think that's about uh, the extent. And uh, the fracking fluid, as we'll see, is mainly water, high pressure water. Uh, this is what it looks like, and uh, uh, when I got this a few uh, months ago for the first time, it, there was a video that showed with it, but somehow now I couldn't get the video on this uh, source, so I'm sorry about that. This is a fracking station. I don't know where it is, but it shows you the size of it. Uh, this hardly is a massacre of the landscape, it seems to me. Here's the big tower that holds the capsule and builds up uh, the pressure and the few workers places alongside. This is uh, the, uh, a map of the world and shows where it's likely to be uh, successful. Um, west coast of Australia, uh, coast of uh, Africa, quite a bit in the United States as you see. And more accurate description here is the trillions of cubic feet uh, that uh, uh, thought of so, so-called shale gas that comes from shale formations uh, that are thought to be uh, possible. You see the UK has 20 compared to China that has 1,275 or so. So China's doing very well and a lot of stored gas, which will be very important. And uh, the United States has something like 800. There's none in the Middle East, as you uh, see uh, here on the slide. And that's an important uh, point, I believe, in that uh, this will take over from oil in some ways and uh, the US will have uh, control, which the Middle East doesn't have. The fracking component is generally water, um, some 95% water, and then some sand. Uh, and a few minor additives uh, just to make things a little better. But the main thing is the sand or the propens that keep uh, the uh, uh, crack uh, open. There's a wonderful uh, uh, review uh, by Robert Mayer, who I've uh, shown here, um, a review of hydraulic fracking, oh, geez, 10 years now uh, that he uh, did this, but it's still uh, very uh, uh, effective. So um, to get uh, coal from close to the surface, sort of a few hundred meters, you don't use uh, fracking, but from about 500 meters on to two, four kilometers, I've written here from two to four, but you know, 500 meters on, um, you can get shale gas and uh, that always uses fracking. I think the gas is potentially a financial bonanza and will be very useful. and. Uh, there are differences of, uh, of possibilities between the countries. And as I've said, the US has much, much more gas than the Middle East. And that's why I think it's going to be important. And I see there's a chat here. And I let me see the chat. Unfortunately, we'll put the, oh, oh, I saw. Uh, this is the chat comment from Sergio. I, I thought it might be a question for me. OK. Um, now. I'm trying to going to do some fluid mechanics of how a crack will uh, propagate. We've done some experiments and some uh, theory, and you see here in the experiments releasing fluid into a gel um, 
that's uh, stressed so that it comes out at right angle. Well, sorry, it, it forms a, oh, excuse me, uh, it forms a, uh, a uh, fluid uh, crack in the gel that's at right angles to the input and you see it uh, looking uh, uh, normally onto it uh, uh, below. The crack very simply looks like this and the fluid uh, goes through here and forces the, the crack uh, apart. There are two resistances uh, that uh, have to be overwhelming the pressure that's uh, driving the fluid through. One is the viscous drag from the side wall. The other is the resistance uh, at the tip from the crack tip opening, that uh, elasticity and takes some effort. As the flow develops, um, the walls separate and so since it's a constant uh, pressure, that uh, means that the effective velocity gets less and hence the slope at the wall gets less. And so the viscous drag gets less important as time goes on. And that means that the resistance uh, from the tip opening uh, increases uh, in importance. And we'll see there are two uh, limits. Um, there's either the viscous limit, which is what happens earlier on when the viscous drag is important. And then it's called the toughness limit. It's not a word that I would have used or given to it. The toughness limit when the resistance from the crack uh, the tip uh, opening. Now that's pretty easy to uh, understand uh, in principle, I think, and that's what it is. And this is now, the first work on crack opening really was uh, by Spence and Sharp in the Sydney of the Royal Society. Um, and uh, this is just an appendix. Uh, here they talk about the inner integral, I of R of S, which you see is enormously complicated by itself. And it's just the inner integral uh, where the E and K are complete elliptic integrals of the first and second kind. And uh, so, the point I want to make here is that uh, this is really a very complicated mathematical system. And I'm not going to go through all the complications. What I'm going to do is show you how you make simplifications to the complications that will be quite worthwhile. And I'll show you that both by theory and experiment. So here's the viscous limit, which occurs uh, first. And here you uh, see the idea is that <clears throat> uh, capital WT is the crack uh, thickness, that's the width of the crack. Uh, and then little w uh, is, uh, varies uh, with radius and uh, time because this crack is going to grow in a, excuse me, axisymmetric way and uh, grow out. There's a pressure and that pressure is due to the forcing of uh, the fluid through the rock and compressing uh, the rock. Um, and that's part of the difficulty. It still uses linear elasticity. As uh, Hook said, ut tensio sic vis, the uh, extension is uh, proportional to uh, the forcing. Um, but uh, it gets to be complicated, as you'll see. The pressure is given in terms of this integral relationship between some complicated M, uh, and that describes how the pressure distribution and E, the uh, Young's modulus, uh, and sigma, the Poisson ratio for the uh, fluid, uh, comes in. Then there's the continuity equation, and this is really the same as we've uh, written uh, uh, before, that. Uh, there's a uh, pressure gradient, that's the PDR. It's forcing this uh, fluid through, through the width uh, W, and then the radial parts uh, come in. And this really, the continuity equation uh, says that uh, if 
uh, there's a change in uh, uh, pressure by continuity, there has to be a, a change in uh, velocity. And this equation we've written down before. And then finally, there has to be a total uh, distribution of description, um, which says uh, that the injection rate is Q, so Q times T is the total volume. And since W uh, is just the half uh, width, um, there's a four pi here uh, to make this the constant. So that's the global mass equation. Now these are nonlinear integral differential equations, which in general would be difficult to solve. So what I'm going to do is to say, look, I'm just going to consider order of magnitudes and see what I can get from that. And as I'll show you, you can go a long way. So you just say that the pressure is the, the constant factor uh, before, forget about uh, dm and dw ds over s times ds uh, is basically the width w over the radius. And this is just an order of magnitude comparison. The continuity equation I'll similarly uh, write down um, as uh, W over T, and then the uh, uh, total volume conservation relationship, the global mass equation. So here you have the three equations in P uh, and uh, W as a function of time, and uh, so you can solve them. And what you get is that the radius will go in, this is in the viscous limit, like t to the four ninths. And uh, the width, uh, I can't just see it because uh, it goes like uh, t to the minus, uh, sorry, goes like this constant to the minus two nine times t to the one nine. So that's uh, what uh, we get just by simple analysis. And there'll be a constant, of course, in front of these signs, but that doesn't matter too much. Let's see if we can get now to the next one. No, it won't work. Why is that? Come on, what's happened? Oh, that would be great. Oh, here we go. Um, oh, so yeah, this just uh, explains uh, the uh, Result that I put down that the radius goes like t to the four ninths and the width goes like t to the ninth with these other uh, quantities. Now, late times are all important, and I like this. This is the uh, rabbit from Alice in Wonderland saying, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. And late times, of course, um, is the toughness limit. What happens when you get uh, further? And this was written up in a paper in uh, 2002. And here we uh, write down, and I'm just going to tell you that this is the result. Uh, here you write down again um, complicated uh, equations, and you can just determine, and I think this is always worthwhile, determining just simple solutions. There'll be a quantity that it's wrong by, and as Ian Sneddon in Scotland used to say, pi squared on 10. Um, so this is the, uh, we have to distinguish the uh, two uh, limits. This is how the, it goes in the viscous limit. And this is the toughness limit uh, where the pressure goes uh, uh, inversely with the radius. So the pressure ra uh, ratio of uh, the two you can find out there. And this is just a, another way knowing how the radius and the uh, with the change, you can see how this difference will change with time and all the other quantities. Oh, there it is again. I don't have to. Come on. Why doesn't this go? Okay, here's some experiments in the viscous limit where we put some fluid down into a hydrous uh, gel. Uh, which we stress at uh, the wall, so it'll come out at uh, right angles, as I said uh, before. And here's after a minute and a half, you see, uh, well, first let's look at the 
a side view, in other words, looking normally onto uh, the uh, extension of the fluid. It's growing nicely uh, symmetrically, and the side view shows uh, how it's cracked its way through. And what's important in what I've uh, said is that the width of the crack is very much less than the length of the crack. So that's how we can make those approximations. Now, here's the front uh, data. And remember, I uh, said that uh, in the viscous limit, R should go like T to the four ninths. And here we've done different viscosity uh, fluids, uh, different uh, structure of the, uh, 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 the gelatin. And so that has a different uh, Young's modulus um, and different uh, fluxes into it. Here's in non-dimensional form, the radius of the front uh, increasing in time for these different uh, experiments. And now we, what we want to do is to see how well it goes like uh, this uh, relationship T to the four ninth. And here where uh, I put uh, in the non-dimensionalization on the, on the Y axis, and we find it goes just uh, against time. Uh, this is a log log plot. We see that it goes like uh, the slope to the four ninths, just as uh, we uh, said uh, it should and evaluated. And also that these quantities um, must be correct because we've changed Q and E and uh, um, mu, the viscosity, and you see they all go on the same uh, line. If it turned out that uh, we got that part wrong, the slope would still be four nines, but it wouldn't lie one on top of the other, which it uh, does. That's the viscous limit. And here's what the uh, crack uh, looks like. This is the uh, thickness at the center. Uh, 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 um, <clears throat> sorry, not the thickness of the, uh, the thickness, uh, the, all of it as a function of radius. And you see it's, it starts at uh, sort of the red line. Um, and then uh, that's the start, really. There's no crack yet. Then we introduce the uh, fluid. And after uh, three seconds, it takes the shape of the yellow line and then the green line and, and so on and so on. And time goes, as you see, um, uh, with the arrow. So now we've got uh, the radius goes, uh, should go like time to the four ninth and the width should go like T to the one ninth. And so this is, yeah, here, here we go. When we rescut the radius and uh, the time, you see it starts off not really quite like this limit uh, because they're just approximations, but it definitely does get there and to the value, so yeah, there we go. Uh, it should go like one minus R to the two thirds and you see how it uh, does that, that's what it approaches. So that's the viscous limit of the crack propagation. And uh, this will be true, of course, if it's magma coming into uh, the earth, uh, being forced uh, by some pressure into uh, the rock. Uh, so nature does the same uh, thing and will obey the same equations. This is now in the toughness uh, limit. So we've changed the uh, parameters. Here again, it's the same uh, um, side view and uh, top view. Um, and here it goes on for these conditions for something like uh, three uh, minutes. But here again, we're going to want to see if we can get it to work. This is the relationship that we uh, determined before. And here's the front uh, as a function of position in, in log, uh, log uh, um, plot. And now we want to put it together. And sure enough, it goes like T to the two fifths. And for these different uh, conditions, they form more or less one on top of the other. I mean, it's not absolutely perfect, um, but that uh, shows that the ideas that we've put forward are uh, correct. Um, 
No, I can't get it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here's now the uh, shape which I've showed you before. This is the, the measured shape in the, in the toughness uh, limit. Uh, and here, if we uh, non-dimensionalize it all appropriately, it goes to this theoretical curve that we've uh, evaluated. Oh yeah, and there's the one minus r squared to the minus uh, to the half. So different uh, sh shape in the theoretical curve. Now the interesting thing is that uh, this is uh, a, a, a photograph taken uh, with some time lapse so that we can see uh, how the velocity varies, and we see it's all nice radial uh, velocity. Um, at a order of uh, a few millimeters uh, a second. You see the length scale of 10 millimeters and uh, the two millimeters a second. And in the toughness flow field, for reasons that I can't, uh, we can't understand, um, it's not quite as symmetric as all that. And it's really somewhat disordered. Nevertheless, it seems to agree with our calculations. And you can read all of that in this uh, paper by Neil O'Keefe, who was the, our graduate student, and myself and Paul Linden, uh, in a paper about four years ago. And this is described more accurately in that uh, paper. I'm only giving you the rough indication. So the take home messages, I guess, is that the gelatin system provides a good experimental setup of uh, to investigate fluid driven fractures and related problems. And there are two limits uh, where the radius goes like T to the four nines uh, in the viscous limit when viscous resistance uh, is important and uh, goes uh, like T to the two fifths in the toughness uh, limit, so it starts as t to the four ninths and then extends as t to the two uh, fifths. And of course, the Young's modulus and the volume of fluid going in, the volume uh, Q, the great uh, plays an important role. Okay. Now I want to say what happens if it's backflow? Um, because in the fracking, it's very important that uh, you want to see how you can get the uh, stuff out of uh, the uh, system. Uh, and that's uh, important. You want to bring the uh, gases out. So what happened with the backflow? Um, now, uh, low Reynolds number, and this is all number are, are reversible. Um, as you uh, see, and I showed you this before, so I won't show it again, whoops. Um, but here we'll do some scaling arguments again to see what happens on the backflow. And again, using the same equations, and I'll just write down, we uh, find that the volume, of course, which will go down because we're taking it out, goes down like t to the minus a, a third. And there's a non-dimensional time and a non-dimensional volume. Um, the non-dimensional volume being the uh, volume when it starts. And here we did some more experiments with different radii and, and different effects. Here's the original data. Uh, this is uh, the relationship again that I wrote uh, before. And here we see it doesn't uh, go very well like t to the minus a third for initial time. It has to get uh, going, but then it really does go very well. And it agrees with the uh, non-dimensionalization, the VC. And, uh... Right, so here is exactly the same as I've uh, shown you uh, before, the crack sh uh, shape. Uh, it starts at the red and then it goes down with uh, time. Uh, and then when we non-dimensionalize it all as has been worked out, then it really falls on top of each other. Now, uh, so the 
if we sorry, I just don't understand what's going on here. The crack radius remains a constant. That's it. Oh, this is in the in the late time periods when you can just say it's elastically uh, covering it. Um, now, now I want to go on and consider something rather uh, different. To say, let's imagine a uh, viscous backflow from a single crack. Uh, this is a, a different uh, study. You have some elastic foundation that's pressing down on this fluid. Um, there's a pressure at the exit uh, and the height of the crack changes with time, as you see here, h is a, a function of time, and there'll be a velocity uh, profile, which will be parabolic because it's a parabolic uh, flow. Um, and we can write down uh, when the pressure at the exit is uh, zero, in other words, we're, uh, we're not stopping any of the fluid coming out, we can write down these equations again exactly as uh, before and uh, get uh, again what we're just going to say is uh, the left hand side looks like one on h squared times t and that's got to be equal to p and uh, the same with the next one and that says that h goes uh, like uh, t to the minus a third and p goes like uh, t to the minus a third so in other words the height goes down as we force this fluid out and the, the pressure also. Um, so this is uh, I, uh, solving the equations both analytically and uh, numerically writing down the full equations. <clears throat> and I li like saying here that, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a work done by uh, uh, Asaf Dana and Asaf wrote to me and said, uh, look, remember these equations. I can uh, get a numerical solution very quickly because I'm a clever cookie. And I wrote back to him and I said, I can get an analytical solution um, because I'm an old man. Um, and then two had better agree. And they did agree. Um, uh, here it is for different values of PE. The uh, uh, thickness is a function of uh, time. Uh, so you see the height goes down uh, with uh, time in the way that we suggested. Okay, now what we uh, did in this uh, JF pa uh, JFM paper in 2018 with Asaf Dana was the graduate student, um, was to say, what happens if we have a series of cracks? What if we, let me, because this is uh, what it uh, looks like uh, as it goes through. There are a series of cracks that uh, evaluate out. And what we're going to say is, let's just model that in a simplified way, as I'll show you, of uh, a whole series of cracks. And then, the well, if you take it from that end, a whole series of cracks that then uh, go down finally until there's one big crack. Or if you like uh, starting in the opposite direction to the arrow, you have just one crack that opens up and then that bifurcates into two or more cracks and that bifurcates again. Um, and this is uh, an example of, uh, that sort of thing. This is actually a photograph that I took a long, long time ago, I think 25, 30 years ago. I was flying over an ice field in Canada uh, and I just saw this out the window of a plane and I took the photograph and somehow I must have kept uh, the original. But that's really what uh, we're saying here. You have one main crack and then it builds up into a series of uh, further cracks and further cracks. We're going to make this simplified so that we can uh, do the theory, uh, but uh, that's basically what I have in mind. So here on the top right, uh, you see you have two cracks, which I've numbered uh, one. Um, they're parallel, they come in and they merge to form 
crack two, but we're going to not take into account the angle and just say we have two cracks, uh, one that are identical, um, that have a height and a uh, pressure given by H1 and, and uh, P1. And now the, uh, then there's going to be a crack two, um, which has a height uh, H2. Uh, and now the pressures uh, in the two are really going to have to be equal in our simplified uh, version. And twice the volume that's flowing through either the individual cracks one um, has got to flow through here. And that's this continuity e equation. And now, as we, I've already said uh, before, we uh, looked at this uh, before, this is going to, by continuity, uh, be driven by the uh, pressure gradient. And uh, again, we have uh, conservation of uh, volume. And that says that H1 will go like T to the minus a third in non-dimensional time. This is the late time asymptotics as before. And H2 will also decrease like uh, T to the minus uh, T, uh, T to the minus third. And uh, the pressures uh, go also in the, the same uh, way. Um, whoops, why can I? Whoops, why, why is this? Play, no, play from current slide. Where did that go away? Um, right. So uh, here's the, the uh, calculations, the full uh, equations. And as you see, they do go down like slope to the minus a third. Initially, of course, it depends on the initial conditions. Um, then we can consider lots and lots of cracks. Uh, as you see, uh, capital N uh, cracks, and uh, they go uh, down. And then that also will lead to uh, this uh, relationship with the uh, thickness of any crack goes down like T to the minus a third, large time asymptotics, and the pressure goes uh, down. Um, why can't we see that? So here's uh, the numerical solution of the uh, equations. And uh, here you see they go down like t to the minus a third as uh, we predicted. So this is now um, in this uh, uh, JFM uh, paper, um, all uh, described. Um, and this is the, the solution as you increase um, n. You, uh, as you have a large number of uh, cracks, and as we go along, different uh, cracks will react in different uh, time. Now, what happens if we have two uh, cracks, uh, or, or two inputs, sorry, um, that uh, we put in the fluid? And here we see, uh, initially, each one of them will uh, um, grow uh, in a circle and won't know the other one is there, but then, as, oh, here they are again, a different uh, view. And this is what they look like when they get close to each other. There they, uh, the inputs you see are, are here and here. And when they first go, there's really very little influence one of uh, the other. But uh, then as they begin to grow, of course, uh, they will influence each other. And the velocity looks a little bit like this. The real requ requirement or desire for the two to uh, uh, join up. And this is all written up in a, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of uh, Sciences, if you want the details. But the point is really in uh, reality, uh, magma cracks take uh, different uh, shapes. Uh, they initially start as in A, and I've taken this from a um, paper by uh, my geological colleague, Steve Sparks and others. Uh, it looks like uh, A, then um, you get chilled margins at the ends because the, the temperature can decrease earlier there. And I had a summer student last year 
who worked on just uh, how this uh, happens. And then slowly the magma solidifies. Um, well, let me just uh, end, uh, I'm sorry, a little earlier by saying there've been something like 3 million frackings that have occurred worldwide. And there has been estimated there's something like 400,000 dikings. So the dikings are natural. The frackings are man-made and you see they much increase over the diking. So what will happen in the future? Well, I think it'll be interesting to see how the fluid comes out and that will tell you something about the fractured structure below because uh, I've talked about what happens if you have one crack. That's what I talked about in the beginning in fracking. But of course, it's a complicated uh, structure and uh, inverse problems are always uh, interesting and difficult, uh, and not often having uh, unique answers. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, I can't remember, but uh, the simplest inverse problem, geophysically simplest inverse problem is uh, comes from a forward problem. If there's an earthquake and you know the structure of the earth, can you determine what the effect will be some way away from the earthquake? And the inverse problem is if you have uh, a knowledge of uh, what the effect of the earthquake is, can you determine the structure of the earth? And as it turns out, uh, the answer is so that is no, so far no. Then we'll have to look into uh, further what happens when there are multiple cracks and they uh, inter interact. Then we could investigate the extra effects due to propens because they know that play an effect. And again, a summer student I had last year looked into that and wrote a very nice uh, paper. Then uh, I'm sure there'll be some nice geological uh, uh, inputs. And then there are lots and lots of other things. So that I think is, uh, oh, well, the take home message, and this must be uh, uh, a summary, or this is a summary in the last slide of uh, what I want to say. Um, I think fracking to recover gases on various sorts is almost definitely going to happen. And on a large scale, uh, and as you see, China has a lot of uh, gas and America has a lot of gas in the Middle East, which has lots of oil, doesn't have much gas. And that's, I think, part of the reason why fracking is going to uh, take on. The fluid flows in a penny shaped crack of increasing radius and height forms. There's uh, a viscosity dominated regime because the largest uh, resistance is uh, the uh, shear stress at the uh, walls. Um, and then there'll be a toughness regime, which gets to dominate over the viscous uh, regime uh, due to the cracking of uh, the rocks. Um, when the pressure is released, the crack height, but not the radius shrinks. The radius stays the same, as I said uh, earlier, I may not have pointed that out as clearly as I could, but the crack height goes down uh, and the radius uh, stays the, the same. And we've uh, looked and modeled the network of uh, cracks, how they interact with each other. Um, and I've written here with more results uh, to come, uh, we hope. Well, that ends uh, a few minutes early, but that does uh, end it and that's, uh, where I'd like to stop, if that's all right. Yes, um, so are there any questions that uh, people would like to put to me? If there are any questions, please. Uh, and in the meantime, I, I wanted to ask a question regarding this, this, this uh, crack network. So, yeah. so how, of course, you, you found by your similarity relations, and I, I have always admired you because you don't need to solve the questions, but <laughs> with these similarities, you can always find useful and powerful relations. So you found that each crack, even the smaller ones, the, the, the dimensions of the crack scale with time to the one term, even the smallest yeah. one. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
But then uh, I, I, I imagine that precisely like in the in the picture you took from the river geometry where you have this uh, yeah. big river and then the branches which are smaller and then the sub branches which are which are even smaller uh pro probably in that okay probably in that case this this the structure will be fractal no i mean of course so I would imagine, I, I, I'm not sure you, you thought about this, I would imagine that then that similar relation that you found for even the subfractures will not hold. Uh, I think that's uh, quite so, uh, Sergio, and maybe I uh, should have said more clearly, um, but I did have in mind uh, that, that that photograph I took was from an aircraft of uh, crack propagation in ice. So it was all on the uh, surface um, and it was not driven by any fluid flow through. It was uh, just uh, um, cracks in, in the ice. So qualitatively, it just sort of looked uh, similar, but only slightly similar, but quantitatively you're quite right it would be quite uh, different and you'd have to look at it in a different uh, way. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so- Another well, problem to solve that would be interesting to do. <laughs> and again, yeah. not in detail, I would say. We, but, as always, we have so many ideas discussing with you for future research. <laughs> things really... I have to do to be there. Yeah. Uh, okay, there is a question there. Uh, Oh, this is very kind. Uh... Okay, that's a very nice comment. No. It's very uh, kind of you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know where you come from, but. Uh... Yeah, I, I don't know him or her either. India. I very, very nice. <laughs> Very nice, very nice, very nice. So well, okay, you. I think like, there are no no questions. We can uh, wish her a fast recovery. Uh, I'm really terribly sorry that I don't feel well, but yeah. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry Herbert. And we really thank you for sharing well, you your be. time and your knowledge with us. Uh, please take care of yourself now, and yeah, let's hope we have you back soon. Okay. And, and Sergio will be in contact. Yeah, I'll, I'll email you. Okay. okay. Goodbye. Bye -bye. All. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Yeah. Bye bye.